what I thought I would do is start today by um, just telling you a story about myself, not, not to be vain, but, but really, why did I get into this work? Uh, I was very happy in a career in regular old business. I was in venture capital. Um, what happened was, right in Boston, in the neighborhoods of Boston, I was approached by a lot of women that wanted loans or venture capital equity to further fund their businesses. It could have been a small bookstore. Um, there were various service businesses. I couldn't find the money anywhere. And certainly not the firm I was working for could give that kind of money. We were giving millions of dollars for big equity deals. So I decided on the nights and the weekends to take to the streets and see what I could find. Um, what kind of help existed in Boston and Cambridge for, for specifically for women to grow their businesses? And there wasn't much. I stumbled across an organization that did microcredit. It was brand new in Boston at the time. It was called Working Capital. And it had gotten a grant from the Ford Foundation to replicate the Grameen Bank model, which some of you may have heard of, in Bangladesh. Now, that model is very simple. It gives loans to women that agree to be in groups of five, um, or actually in some cases more. But to keep it simple, the idea was that in Bangladesh, women would start their uh, business with this loan, pay it back, and with the profits, uh, be able to boost themselves out of poverty. That was the thinking. And actually, that was the brand. In Boston, it turned out, the very same model was being applied, something very, very similar. So I went to the founder and I said, I'd like to volunteer. I will help you on nights and weekends, do whatever you need me to do. And so I was his very first volunteer. And I went out and I worked with churches in the community, um, specifically, uh, that were reaching uh, immigrant populations, um, uh, Irish American populations, African American populations, um, and uh, what uh, uh, different, different kinds of um, categories, but the, the house, um, HEW. And so what happened? Well, what I saw was this credit wasn't working very well. We would go out, form groups, people would take a loan or two, and they would say, thank you very much, this has been a wonderful experience, um, but we're kind of on our feet now, and it's time to go. And so, but, but it wasn't clear were their businesses getting any better. So I thought, aha, let me learn, because all of this great activity is going on overseas, maybe I can learn and study it and bring it back to Boston. So that began my journey. So to keep things simple, I did a few assignments, and I ended up with an organization called Catholic Relief Services. And I was heading up their microfinance division. And it turned out it had a very large portfolio of institutions that copied a Grameen-style <laughs> model, um, and several hundred million dollars worth of investments around the world in this. I thought, great, you know, I've landed in this job, and I'm going to learn all about it, and I can bring it back home. And I left, I said goodbye to the business world, and I signed on to the world of development. The problem was, as I went around the world, I kept asking women what they wanted, and what we were offering was never what they wanted. <laughs> over and over again. <laughs> And so, and, and um, I think it was Hardy's presentation yesterday that talked about cognitive awakening. Um, and certainly Revan Lawson, the first night, when you go, something's wrong here. What people are telling me and what we're supplying are very, very different. So what were women telling me? Uh, they were telling me that they did not want to be in debt. They were telling me that they did not use loans for businesses. They were telling me they preferred to save, but they had trouble saving because money would trickle out of the household. A child might need it, or a husband might want it, or they would be tempted um, by some trinket. And saving was very, very difficult, but they wanted to save in order to pay for school fees, um, in order to store up for a hungry moment, a, a lean week, because their incomes were unsteady, so they wanted to be able to smooth that income. And being in debt was actually not a solution. It was a problem. So I went back to the agency I worked for and said, what we're doing isn't working. Well, as you can imagine, an entire industry had 
an apparatus had been developed around preserving the idea that it was working. And there was absolutely no evidence to support what I had seen. Um, so, so this was in the year 2001 when I said, the emperor has no clothes. It's absolutely not working. In fact, what we're doing is we're maintaining institutions that maintain themselves through interest and through debt. And so if you're a borrower and I keep, I want you to keep borrowing from me so I can make profit off the interest so I can keep paying my staff. And so this institutionalization locked us into a mode that was nearly impossible to break out of. So I said, I, you know, I'm going to go back to the business world. I might as well make money from rich people. <laughs> and um, it seems somehow wrong to be making a lot of money from poor people. And so <laughs> as I was about to quit, a colleague said, wait a minute. Before, before you turn in that letter, and I'm not kidding because I had, I had verbally actually resigned, you have to go see what's going on in India. There's something a little bit different there. And I know I have three Indian colleagues that, that um, maybe can chime in at the end. And I said, okay, I'm happy to. So I, I, I went to India and uh, I immediately wrote the person that sent me there and said, I'd like to move here as soon as possible because I think there's some answers. And um, they said, well, it's not going to happen right away, but we'll, we'll try to figure something out. And sure enough, uh, that's what happened. Now, what was I seeing that was different from what I was seeing in Boston and what I was seeing in countries around the world? I was seeing things where wh you would go from village to village, and I'm just going to show a few photos. This is not a, a PowerPoint. And there was a, quote, microfinance program, but the program, no one was talking about money. And I kept thinking, why aren't they talking about money? They do everywhere else. You know, we ask about the loans, we ask about the repayments, what did you use the loan for? And people weren't talking about money. They were talking about, this is actually um, a photo of saying, is the anklet bracelet um, jewelry, or is it a chain around your ankle? Um, and it says, it's, it's in English here because actually an artist friend went and, tra and translated these. Um, or what is the importance of, of English isn't, you can see, a marital equilibrium. Um, there, there were, there were, everywhere I went, women had drawings and photos of things that mattered to them. It wasn't always about social injustice. Um, sometimes it was about, I don't know how to get my land back. Um, and you're going to be hearing more from Priyanka about um, the caste and tribal system on, on Friday, so I won't tell you too much. But, but there's a whole group of people that have difficulty accessing um, what technically they have a right to. So I was amazed. I thought, here's a microfinance program and no one's talking about finance. That's what I want to see. That's how, how did that happen? How did that happen? So I'll show you just a couple more photos. Um, so, it's very, very simple. In, in the Grameen microfinance, an NGO, <laughs> wow, it's an easy crowd to please. Um, <laughs> in, in Grameen microfinance, um, an NGO, or a, let's call it an MFI or a bank, we don't need to get too technical because that's actually a lesson we learned, lends to a group of women and then depending on how the model is, they divvy it up and then they pay it back. And what I was seeing in, let me leap over here, in India was, was very, very simple. Women were pooling their own resources together. It might be a dollar a week um, or a dollar a month, whatever they could save and then they were lending it out. And the NGO's role was simply to organize these women and help them um, because it, it, it took a few weeks, sometimes a few months of training. And then the theory was if those women really were passionate about what they were doing, they might help form a new group themselves. And on and on this ripple effect would take place. Actually, there were limits to that ripple effect, but I did find one woman who formed 47 groups on her own 
she was a member of one group. Um, and I know that some of you have worked with women's groups. When you see that happen, it's, it's pretty amazing because uh, there were, was no payment in that case. It was completely volunteer. That's what we all wish for, um, but it's, it's, it's not seen very often. So imagine, it's just people putting in their own money. And then you think, I was thinking, well, how could they afford that? I mean, we're talking about people that have nothing. How can they afford that? Every single person said the same thing. We all make something somehow. The question is, can we take a little tiny bit of it and hive it off and put it in a place that it can accumulate in this fund and later we can use it when we need it as a loan? But all of us do. Once in a while, yes, there's somebody who's completely destitute, but people can do this. And what they were saying is, if we do that and we control our own resources, then in fact, being able to manage our own savings, that's power. That's what we want. In fact, a lot of them didn't even borrow from the fund once the fund was created. That was, that was absolutely not needed. So this actually looks a lot like what I started to discover was everywhere. And I know a lot of you are going to laugh at me, but there are traditional systems around the world. And I think in Mexico, it's called a tanda. Is that correct? And in Ethiopia, it's an ikub. Um, Indonesia, it's an arisan. And, and these are groups that completely without the assistance of an NGO come together. And, and by the way, they're all over the United States. Um, for any of you from, from the US, I don't know about Canada. But they come together and they pool their resources on a regular basis. And then one person takes the pot home. So this tradition has existed in India for a long time too. And this was a variation of that, um, right? So not one person taking the pot home each week, but the pot accumulating. But I, when I started running into these traditional systems more and more, I said, well, why are you doing that? What, what, why are you pooling your money and then one person taking it home? It didn't really make any sense to me, right? We would all come in, put in a dollar, and then Machi takes home the $10. And then we repeat the thing next week. <laughs> why, why would we do that? Does, does, sorry? <laughs> he said, I like it. I said, only the first month you can like it. Oh, yeah, because then you have to worry about, is the next person going to pay? Um, but why would people do that? Sorry. Uh, yes. In my opinion, and how would you increase that is maybe because, um, if I understood correctly, as in Kurdistanoi, we also have this kind of system where uh, each month uh, you pay a certain, of, uh, a certain amount of money for your group. And then each time they will take, let's say, a black um, cash. They take the whole block of cash. Yeah. Yes. And then, uh, which means um, that person uh, who is taking, he, uh, he can use that money. Uh, because in one month, a person cannot, for example, find 1,000 US dollars because his salary is only maybe $200. So which means uh, in a certain time, he can use his money. Uh, uh, and buy or use for a larger thing, but um, uh, stru uh, how do you say that? Um, kind of dividing this money uh, e each month and paying back. Exactly. So, so that's exactly right. So what the women were saying over and over is, and, and men too, by the way. This is not a, 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 these traditional groups can be men, women, or mixed, um, and they can be rich or poor. Uh, I've I've seen people actually Fletcher students have been financed through these groups. Um, which I, I discovered two years ago. Um, so so you, you can be zero to $50,000 that you're, or, or whatever you set. Why they were doing this is exactly as you say. They wanted a useful lump sum. And by just having dribs and drabs and coins on the counter, that wasn't going to get them anything. But if they pooled the resources, then somebody could buy whatever they wanted. Um, sometimes people picked the same things, like a cow. Sometimes they picked different things, like I, you know, I'm going to use my money when I get it for whatever I want. So these systems are out there, and this was this system was much more akin to what people were already doing. So in a sense, that was the first lesson. If you um, offer something that is actually what people are doing, the chances are they're going to want it more. Whereas this system was alien. And yes, they used it. Grameen Bank has uh, 10 million or more borrowers. It's not that they're not using it, but in fact, it's not as useful as what some of their own uh, 
what their own funding is for. <laughs> so that, the, there's, there's two points I want to make before a, a, a final point here, which is um, it's, it's tricky, it's slippery to deliver services you yourself would not settle for. I don't belong to a savings group, um, to a group that I just described. Um, I also don't belong to a Grameen Bank group. But the savings group is a lot closer to my, my um, apartment association, or actually a condo association, than is a credit group. Um, we have to sort through a lot of the same problems. So what, the more I talked to people, the more I saw, actually, we have variations of this in my backyard. And I can see why it's very attractive to you, where I had to agree that that credit group, money coming from the outside, and then you all have to guarantee each other's loans. I, I wouldn't guarantee my neighbor's loans, I can tell you that much. Um, so so uh, th that was the first lesson, is be wary of services you wouldn't settle for. You talked about the table scraps the other day, um, or yesterday. And uh, people were saying, you know, this, you're giving us your scraps. You're keeping your institution alive, and you're giving us your scraps. Um, another point was um, to, to realize that your presence is felt. And by that, I don't mean just me. Obviously, I look very different if I go into certain communities. Even in downtown Boston, my presence is felt as an outsider. So that's true no matter what. All you have to do is really recognize that. There's not a whole lot you can do about it. But if you think you're not changing the game, um, you're, you're, you're mistaken. So, um, and I'll describe the game in a second. What is that game? Because I'm just going to quickly speed to these lessons. There's a hidden chessboard. People are playing and using your resources, whether it's microfinance or you're delivering a food program or um, you have a peace and rec re reconciliation program. They're there. They're going to your trainings, but they're gaming the system. And why not? That's what I do. Um, that's what everybody does. And if you, in, you need to understand that you might not know the rules of the game that they're actually playing. And I don't mean that in a sinister way. Um, I'm just saying, there's another game going on. A, a challenge was, do you pay people for services that um, are essentially voluntary? And what if you don't? Let me give you a quick example. These NGOs that would go out and form these groups, actually the ones that I fell in love with and thought were so great, um, their staff were paid. But then they would go and ask the groups to give of their time and to form other groups for free. And there was this inherent conflict. Um, not paying people was a problem, too. People felt undervalued. Well, so, so that was a, a, a situation. This I'm picking up from this crowd because the reality is, you all are a lot of fun, and I spend a lot of time with bankers and microfinance people. This has been like the greatest two days. <laughs> everyone, everyone feels like that. They want to have fun. And most development, including microfinance, is boring, it's dreary, it's dull. And we don't recognize the fun factor. And nothing has hit more home to me than the last two days is humor, fun, entertainment, often and, and actually, on the film we saw on the first night, so looking at those trainings, that was anything but dreary. That was exciting. That was powerful. Um, so you have a lot to offer the world of development assistance. And then the last slippery slope, um, and, and I'm not going to go into each one. We can talk about it in a Q&A. But it's so easy to professionalize development assistance. And you learn the language, you learn the formulas, you learn the sectors, the labels. And as soon as you do, and you have a right to because you're trying to take the shortcuts, as soon as you do, you're excluding people. And I see it happen over and over again. We come up with our fancy terms and our words, and people say, well, I don't know microfinance. I'm not a microfinance expert. You are. When in fact, it, you described perfectly how an RSN works. That's microfinance. So we alienate people by our words. And, and that happens, unfortunately, a lot in development assistance. So I'm going to say those are, those are general development assistance slippery slopes. Now, I'm going to, I'm going to skip to the last here. So, so what was the system? <laughs> God, I wish I had done more. <laughs> Take that out. <laughs> Okay, 
So what was the system in India? And then what, um, I can discuss later at another time what were the problems, because there were a lot of problems. But what, what made me excited to move? Well, yes, there was this local group, and there was the community organizing, and it was people meeting around things other than money, but money was the glue, right? So money has this, this uh, people like to talk about their pocketbooks. They like to talk about how am I going to make that next school fee payment. So money was very, very much the glue. Um, but what was the system? And I think, Jack, this is what one of the things you wanted me to get at, is, is how can outside assistance work together? Leah, you brought up how can we work with governments? How can we work with NGOs? So in India, the system, for all of its flaws, um, it has opportunities. There's a central bank. I won't bore you with the details, but consider it government, right? They will, they, um, sorry, I left out a very important part of this equation. NGOs will form these groups. And they do that, why? Because it's in their mission to empower. Um, they do it for a variety of reasons, to bring health services to a community. There's a ready group in place that does savings. That's going to help their health cause. Or they are fighting the local landlord to release, um, to make, ensure that the, the kids uh, get a chance to go to school. I mean, there are many, many different things, reasons NGOs would want to form these savings groups, and they do. So the central bank um, has a scheme where it will lend to local banks, and whatever the groups have saved up is augmented by a local bank. So for example, let's say in this front row our group has saved up $100. We're now eligible to apply for additional <coughs> an additional loan beyond our $100 to the local bank and get that funding. That's reaching about 90 million people. So that's, that's scale, right? That's about 90 million people is being reached through this very simple scheme. So what happens is over, let's say, a period of two years, a year to two years, <laughs> The group will pay back the bank, so individuals will pay back the group, the group will pay back the bank, and on and on it goes. Now, here's the tricky part. Also in this scheme, the, the, the central bank pays NGOs 2,500 rupees, which is about 50, 60 dollars? 48. 48. Okay, well, there you go. Um, <laughs> uh, so, uh, to, to, to form these groups. And this gets back into the question of, you know, it, it, is that co-opting uh, the agenda of the NGO to become formers of groups for banks instead of actually their mission? Um, so the, the, the system is very much in place. It's going through something called SHG2 right now. Um, it's, it's been around for 20 years. It's probably going to be around for another 20 years. It has been co-opted by political agendas. There have been problems with it. But I can tell you from experience, it's the closest thing I've seen to cooperation between the pi private sector, the public sector, groups of people, and individuals on a massive scale that, depending on what happens here, has been used for local empowerment. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Um, next, I would, I would like to introduce my, my new colleague, I'm very delighted to meet today, is Sadaf Lakhani. And she has um, experience well with, with the UN and um, uh, many global agencies. And she's going to give you a bit about her perspective on external assistance and what it can do to promote local empowerment. I think Jack already mentioned that I was um, an FSI student, youngish student back in 2007, the second FSI. Um, and honestly, it was an eye opening experience, really an eye opening experience. Um, I think I wasn't really prepared for what I learned, and very similarly to what you've, you've learned here. And there were certain issues that, you know, kept on kind of percolating in my head. And um, it was a little bit like Thomas Kuhn talks about the nature of scientific progress. 
not being incremental, but happening in revolutions of thought, to these paradigm shifts. And I felt that that's what happened here, but it took me a little bit to, a little while to come to terms with it. There were two issues that really bothered me. One was the issue of liberation struggles, and whether we should engage with liberation struggles, and how, and the whole kind of sets of values behind that. Pretty rich from someone who works on development, pushing a set of values out with what we do. But that's all in hindsight. The second issue was really to do with, well, what can I do with this material? I work on post-conflict programming, or now, as it's known, fragile and conflict-affected states programming. What can I do with what I've learned at the FSI? How can I apply it in my work and encourage my agencies to take this into consideration? So that's something that I want to talk to you about today. It, it was also one of the flashpoints of learning during the FSI 2007. Jack, I've never thanked you um, for the opportunity of being a respondent during that FSI. Jack asked me if I would be so kind as to speak during, um, during that FSI. He only told me after I agreed that I was going to be a respondent to Larry Diamond. Thank you very <laughs> much to that. And what we talked about in that, in that session was what happens after these liberation struggles. There is a pretty poor, pretty dismal record of achievement in sustaining peace or moving for, from what I call official peace to durable, sustainable peace. And you can use the word democracy, you can use the word, you can word, you conceive it in other ways, but in moving to a state which recognizes and responds to the needs of people. So that's a little bit about what I'm going to talk today. And I am going to start off with a little bit of jargon. Oh, that's right. Thank you. By telling you about what is happening within the development paradigm. And that is this concept of fragile and conflict affected states, which is developed quite recently. And that development actors have had a bit of a paradigm shift themselves. And this has been prompted by this poor record of achievement in certain countries. So what are fragile states? In effect, they are states where the government cannot or will not, and I think this is an important part, deliver core functions to the majority of its people, including the poor. There's, there's two things here. One is that the state is not capable of doing it. The second is the state has no intention of fulfilling its functions. And there's a whole set of criteria that have been developed by different actors for assessing who is fragile, what does fragility mean, and these are some of them. They're based around three sort of themes of authority, that the state should have authority over its people and its territory, that it should have the capacity to deliver to it, and that it should have the legitimacy of the people as well. And this legitimacy goes beyond being elected into positions of power, but legitimacy in terms of being able to respond to people and being seen as responsive to them, so that continued legitimacy. So these are some of the criteria that we're dealing with. Risk of conflict or violence, accountability of government institutions, territorial control, levels of poverty in the country and the ability to protect the poorest of the population and some of the other characteristics like weak institutions and, and governance systems. Before anyone else mentions it, I'm going to say there are some serious problems with defining fragility in this way. The OECD DAC, which was one of the pioneers of this, came up with a list, almost a permanent list of 45 countries. And Syria, amazingly, wasn't on that list. Indonesia is not on that list. Papua New Guinea is not on that. There's a whole series of, of actors who should or could be on that list and, and are not. But effectively, we're talking about one quarter of the world's population. That's 1.5 billion people in approximately 45 states. And, and why does it matter for development actors? Because these are the countries which have bucked the trend that's taking place in the rest of the world. In the rest of the world, in low-income countries, you see poverty coming down. You see a lot of countries on track to achieve the Millennium Development Goals, but not the fragile and conflict-affected states. Most of them are nowhere near achieving any of the Millennium Development Goals. So why, again, why is violent conflict now, not just fragility, but violent conflict, important for international actors? 
partly because it's symptomatic of severe government failures in responding to the needs of people. When people have to take up arms, their grievances have become so acute, they often feel that they have no other recourse but to do so. It also signifies ruptures within society. It's not just about the state-society relationship, but the way in which people relate to each other or groups relate to each other within society. And some of the other reasons are that 40 f countries that have experienced violent conflict are 44% more likely to fall back into violent conflict within five years. In fact, of all the conflicts taking place currently, there are very few of them that are new. Most of them have been reignited from previous conflicts that have been seen as resolved. So what this really signifies is a failure of international actors, multilateral bodies, country allies, NATO, the UN, etc., and development actors, and being able to bring development to these countries. So what I wanted to do is talk a little bit about what Jack was saying, identify some different kinds of entry points and identifying struggles and movements within fragile and conflict-affected countries that we could try to support or that actors working on nonviolent social movements could see as entry points. So first of all, we, got to, we have to start with what are some of the needs and the challenges in post-conflict states. I'm, I'm saying post-conflict, but they apply more broadly to fragile states, and you'll find that they apply in a range of different countries. So first of all is that in many parts of the state, you have a lack of acceptance of the end of the formal end of violence, that the peace process is not accepted by all actors, or that the victory is not accepted by all actors. So certain parts of the country continue to become exposed to, to armed conflict. Secondly, the legacy of, of violent conflict is that you have a large number of small arms and light weapons in circulation. And this increases the risk of fragility of a, of a state falling back into conflict. <clears throat> you also see that Either the state was never present in some areas or the conflict has driven the state out of certain areas. So you have no military presence, you have no police, but it also means you have no services being delivered to the population, no schools, no health clinics, no local government. There's also a need to build rapid political transitions. Often you have turnovers in power, you have new systems of governance being put in place, new electoral systems, and these are actually very risky situations. We've seen, for example, in, in Nepal, I think there's somebody here from Nepal, where there have been a number of different political transitions, each one of them that has stumbled, and, and Nepal is still trying to, trying to work this out. There's also a need to rebuild infrastructure that was destroyed. I'm not going to go on and on and on, but the list is very, very long. Within that, I've kind of tried to group it into three different areas. One is addressing these violence and insecurities. The second one is building a nation as well as building a state. So coming up with a common vision or a common agenda for, it, for the state and uniting what often happens as disunited factions within society under this nation building idea. And the third one is post-conflict recovery and development. So to put back the infrastructure of the country to ensure that there's inclusive growth and development for everybody in the country. So now coming to some of the opportunities. With, with regard to the continuation of violence and insecurities, so you have a lack of authority of the state in parts of the country. You have the presence of armed non-state actors, like we've seen, for example, in countries like Afghanistan, where the state doesn't have full authority over the whole country. You have a range of different actors who have arms and are waging different wars, ideological wars or wars over resources, all kinds of things. On top of that, in many countries where there's a power vacuum, you have criminal gangs forming. This has been particularly true in some cities. Um, and, and as I said, this doesn't only apply to post-conflict situations. Um, Rio de Janeiro, I think uh, there was a period of time, the same period in which Colombia was seen as being in conflict and classified as, as a country in civil war, where the number of killings in the city of Rio de Janeiro Rio de Janeiro were actually larger than the number of people that died in conflict in Colombia. So you have a major issue 
of this sort of mutation of violence into other forms. I've been working on Papua New Guinea recently where the homicide rate in some of the major urban areas is astronomical. I mean, we can't even quote them because they're so crazy. Uh, I'll give you a figure, 700 out of 100,000 population. A comparator for that is Washington DC, which was seen as the homicide capital of the world a few years ago. Per year. Washington DC was, now it's about 20, 20 per 100,000. So 20 and 700,000. I mean, you're talking about huge scales of violence occurring within society. You're talking about militarized communities, communities that have taken up arms themselves in response to these insecurities that they're facing. And often, once there's been a formal peace, you've got huge numbers of former combatants, people that have had arms that have been demobilized and hopefully disarmed and now need to be reintegrated, whatever that means, back into society. So I'm going to talk about one of these particular opportunities later on using a case study, and that is support for communities to resist or limit the actions of non-state actors working in their locales. I'm going to give you an example of a community. There's numerous examples, but an example of a community in which they were able to establish peace zones and stop both rebels and governments from incurring into their territory and disrupting their economies, their everyday lives. Second area is that of post-conflict nation state building, as we've said, the idea that peace agreements don't often address the root causes of conflict. They talk about some kind of power sharing agreement, but often these are simply reflections of cleavages within society that need to be addressed. Things like inequalities in assets and, and, um, and resources and the way that they're distributed amongst different social groups. Um, and often this means that there needs to be a kind of a common vision amongst people as to what this nation means, what it's, how it, what, it's, what it's aiming for and how it's going to be able to do that. One of the issues that has come up time and time again is that of addressing grievances and tensions between different ethnic groups. And I think that um, one of our, our colleagues, um, Reverend Jim, mentioned this as well. And this has become a big issue in a number of, of fragile states. Finally, I'm going to use another example as a case study now of the need to ensure social accountability in post-conflict recovery and development. That governments need to deliver services, they need to ensure economic growth and development, but they also need to know that this is done in a way that is responsive to the, to the demands of people and that people can hold them accountable. Now, social accountability isn't a new thing. This is something that development actors have been doing for a long time. What is new, though, is that people don't see this as a priority in conflict-affected states. The priority is to rebuild, set up inclusive enough coalitions, and just get on with it. But what I'm arguing is this undermines the long-term sustainability of that piece. OK, so some of the examples. This first one is from Ghana, and I know this is not a fragile or conflict-affected state by anybody's list, but um, I thought it was a great example because I worked there and I'm very enthusiastic about what happened there with regard to water privatization that was proposed. So the link between water and health is evident. The MDGs list access to safe drinking water as one of the priorities. Um, water has been linked to, or lack of access to water has been linked to malnutrition, infant mortality, to waterborne diseases such as typhoid, cholera, and, um, and guinea worm. And in fact, the Ministry of Health in Ghana said that 70% of diseases affecting the population were related to the lack of access to safe drinking water. So water is a big issue. At the time of this proposed water privatization, 70% of Ghanaians were living on less than a dollar a day, and 30% of them didn't have access to safe drinking water. And the government that, until that time, had constantly been putting public money into delivering water to the poorest segments of the population was suddenly under pressure from some international actors to privatize its water utility company. And this was for the reason of cost recovery, of uh, making more effective um, a public utility company, you know, tightening social spending, the usual kind of structural adjustment programs that we all know about from the, from the um, 
the international financial, um, the IMF and the World Bank. So what happened was that you saw a 95% increase in fees for water prior to the privatization as sort of a, a way of easing people into it. And there were some extreme concerns amongst the population about what was going to happen. Could, was this going to be sustained, the level of increase in fees? What was going to happen in terms of delivery to the poor, the subsidized delivery, in terms of expansion to rural areas? And there were a number of concerns about the way in which this privatization process was being undertaken. The content of the process, the tender and the contracting, and the way in which there was a lot of secrecy um, on the part of the government in doing this. So there was a coalition that emerged, and this was formed by a, an organization called ISADEC, and they had been working on health issues at the community level. So they had a really strong grassroots constituency. And they built this very broad-based coalition, which included some of the strongest trade unions in the countries, churches, because faith-based organizations were very strong and, and active in community life. They worked with students, with environmental groups. I mean, they really included anybody to whom water was an important issue. And they employed what was really a very diverse type of strategy. ISADEC did a lot of technical work on the water privatization, looking at what the impacts of this would be. But they also took it up to the political parties and got it on the agenda of the political parties. So they raised that for the upcoming elections. They politicized it. They popularized it. They asked students to take up the issue in, in the universities. There were marches. There were all kinds of protests. But they also capitalized very much on international links. I don't know if anybody here from the US knows a public citizen that works on, <coughs> on, on you know, public citizen. They, they work very closely on monitoring of, of the World Bank and the IMF, and, and particularly on, on SAPs. And ISADEC linked up with them and put pressure here in Washington. Sorry, not in Washington. Not in, we're not in Washington now, but they put pressure in Washington. Was, was, was it the IMF and the World Bank that were the two main actors pushing? The World Bank and DFID were, okay. yeah. And so they linked up also with Christian Aid and Water Aid in the UK. And they got them to put pressure on DFID as well back in the UK. And they also linked up with other actors, like um, an organization that had worked in South Africa against parts of the water privatization there that were led by RAND, the same company that was going to be awarded the contract in, in Ghana. And they built their allies and they, they, they sort of coalesced support you know, across Ghana and internationally as well to, to publicize this issue and to really put pressure on different actors to try and get this change. But they also took a very incremental approach. They didn't say, we don't want privatization. They started off by asking for publicizing the contract, publicizing the tender process, and then let's have a series of, um, of assessments to see what the impact of these would be. So it was a very slow and incremental process. They also linked up with, I don't know how this happened, but with, with the organizers of the Bolivian movement against the privatization of water in Cochabamba. I don't know if that was initiated by the Ghanaian organizations or whether they linked out, but it's an important part of the strategy as well to learn from other organizations who'd undertaken similar work. Now, in case you're curious about the outcomes of this, in this all started in, in the year 2000. In 2004, the World Bank provided $103 million in a grant for the Urban Water Project. This means that they, they provided money that the government could use for social spending. They didn't say no to the privatization, but they provided a, a large grant. The management contract was eventually awarded in 2005, but it was a management contract rather than a selling off of the public utility. That was for a five-year period, which was already was a win. And then in 2008, maintaining the pressure to monitor what the outcome was of this management contract, the government was going to pull the contract back, just kept it running until the end of the contract for legal reasons, and in 2010, there was no renewal of it. So it returned to state management. So in, in a sense, you could say that this was a win for, for ISADEC and the coalition. But the, you know, the outcomes are important, but it's also important to look at what the strategy was that they employed.
So the other, the other example I'm going to look at is that of the way in which communities resisted or limited the actions of armed state actors, armed non-state actors in their area. And I don't know if anyone here is familiar with Mindanao in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they've had, uh, I think it now it's more than a 30-year conflict with, um, between the government and the Moro Islamic Liberation Front. And initially, a large section of the population were very much with the rebel fighters. There was seen to be ideological and, and other reasons for why there needed to be some level of change in the way Mindanao was, was governed. But at some point, local communities developed conflict fatigue. They were tired of what was happening to them. Their lives were disrupted, economies were disrupted, there was no services being delivered, and they wanted a change. And what they did was, initiated by an organization based in Manila called the Coalition for Peace, they got together with church-based organizations, both Catholic and Protestant, in one part of Mindanao, and they tried to negotiate with the armed parties there to limit their activities and their incursions into villages. This was not successful, but they held on to this idea that they could somehow secure their areas against these, these actors. And what they did was, like, during a fiesta day, I, I'm not sure of whether this was a spontaneous action or whether this was planned, but at some point, some of the key leaders of the communities, and including s school superintendents, don't underestimate the power of school superintendents in, in these districts. But they came together and they declared unilaterally, unilaterally a people's ceasefire. Not from the government, not from, from, from the rebels, but from the people. That we are undertaking a ceasefire, we don't want you in our communities. And this was respected that day, largely, not entirely, but it was respected that day. And this led them to undertake further peace promotion activities to signify that these were communities that were not allies of either of the armed parties. They distributed banners and headbands to illustrate visually that they were, they were against this. They po posted signs at their village perimeters saying that this was a peace zone and that people with arms were not welcome in. They defied armed <laughs> actors in their villages. Women continue to collect water or undertake livelihoods activities in and amongst military operations. And they kept on pushing the government to institute these zones of peace in selected areas. And they use, again, a combination of methods. The church wrote position papers to say from, from their Catholic and Protestant positions that the war was no longer viable and that the government should give up their militarized operations. They did monitoring of incursions into these peace zones via SMS. They organized people's marches and, and protests. And again, what were the outcomes here? Well, the government actually took over this idea of zones for peace. And um, unfortunately, they kind of mutated it, as, as happens, even arming some of, some of the local government militias. Um, so what happened was that people sought to distinguish themselves from this and set up a new generation, gave it a different name, but continued on with the concept. And it worked. They managed to secure peace in their villages. And in some places, the war bypassed them entirely. Or in other places, they were definitely far less affected because they said that we don't want to be part of this. What it also did was reduce tensions between different Christian and Muslim communities. Because part of, part of the reason for the continuation of the armed conflict was because communities were calling upon either the state or the rebels in resolving what were really community level issues but had been tra transpired into broader ideological struggles. What they really did was keep up the pressure on all parties to find a political solution to this problem. It hasn't been found yet but they continue to operate. So I think that what we're trying to, to look at here is what is the role of strategic nonviolent actions in supporting civil resistance movements, or let's call them social movements in fragile and conflict affected states. One is that they raise the consciousness and they reframe the problems, the discriminations and the inequalities before they turn into acute grievances that lead to people 
wanting to take up arms because they have no other way of addressing these grievances. They can help to mobilize interest and resources to intervene in social conflict and try to change the structures of, of societies before violence again becomes a viable means to achieve their goals. They also help to, and this is something that perhaps Kim and I will touch on later, develop alternatives to current political, economic and cultural practices. And this is an issue that I think is implicit in many social movements, but maybe we should talk about explicitly in terms of the values and the goals that they're, they're pursuing. Finally, if we can talk about what are some of the opportunities and constraints for support for these types of actions by international actors. The opportunities are that, for those of you that work on, in development, there's been very much a heavy focus of attention on fragile and conflict affected states. I don't know if this is really different, but there is a claim that this is a break from business as usual. And certainly, we're seeing people turn away from the usual kind of capacity development approaches to embrace new ideas of supporting civil actors instead. There's definitely an emphasis on social accountability, whereas before it was about putting state structures in place, public service delivery, ensuring effective administrations, and now it's very much about how do people interact with the state? How can people hold the state accountable? Another opportunity, maybe not such a, a positive one, is the aid dependency of many of these states. You can see that as an opportunity if you want. It's also a, a negative aspect of, of these. Another opportunity is the fact that international actors have access to knowledge of what's happened in other contexts that might be applicable in countries in which they work. This is, I guess, a lot of organizations call this South-South learning, but it's an important area in which they can, they can facilitate actions. Finally, some of the constraints. And I think we, Jack touched on this before about discourse. Discourse is more than language. It's really about the ideology of, of these organizations, these international actors. And there's very little awareness and understanding of nonviolent conflict methods. In fact, when I was talking to Jack and Maché about these types of opportunities, one of the first things I said is, please, we cannot use that term when we talk to international actors. Um, we have to find a different way of framing it or perhaps pick up on what they're already doing and illustrate these as actions that are in line with nonviolent conflict methods. The other issues of, of implementation, international organizations are really governed by these bureaucratic procedures, who to work with, competitive procedures to, to procure services and how to implement them. And I see this as being particularly restrictive in working with flexible actors that don't have organizational structures to churn out reports and fin you know, financial statements and so on. The other one is very much the reluctance of civic movements to accept assistance. I don't know if any of you have worked with civic movements that have been approached by international actors for funding, but I've worked with some who do not want to acknowledge that they're receiving assistance from us, or some who don't want to receive assistance from us. And that's because aid can distort incentives. Aid can make you behave in different ways, particularly in being accountable to the people that give you money rather than being accountable to the people whose needs you're claiming to, to represent. And that, becomes, that brings me back to the final point, and one which really challenges everything that I've said already. And that is, international actors are colluding in what's happening in fragile and conflict-affected states. International actors are responsible also for what's happening. I mean, we, we pump a lot of our aid into these countries. We have been engaged in development for decades and decades and decades. Is it simply technical that this hasn't worked? Or are there other reasons, political and much bigger outside of the development agenda, that we haven't seen successes here? I think just want us to think about that in terms of, of the constraints. So, so, so um, we're only going to have time and 